Oh man, it has been way too long. I I so hope that your holidays were wonderful and that your new year has already been it's so incredibly kind to you. Uh, my name is Ryan. I make music under the name Sleeping at Last, and this podcast is where I have the privilege of telling you all about the making of my music. Today's episode is all about the Enneagram Type 8, and uh, I'm just so excited to share my new song with you, uh, to tell you about how it came together, and to discuss these these really dynamic and strong and secretly soft people who make up uh, the Enneagram Type 8. But before we dive in head first, I wanted to catch you up on a handful of brand new things that I made uh, since the last episode. Uh, and I'll make it super, super quick, okay? So first, back at the end of October, I released a new song in my astronomy series, which are uh, songs inspired by different events and discoveries in space. Uh, the song was called October 30th, 2018, Kepler, Good Night. Uh, and it was in tribute to NASA's space telescope, which was, of course, called Kepler, uh, which after nine years of space exploration and, and collecting data on planets and stars, it, it ran out of fuel and completed its mission. Kepler was NASA's first ever planet hunting mission, and, and with more than, uh, I think it was 2,600 planet discoveries uh, from outside of our solar system, it, it entirely blew away all of the expectations. Uh, and so on October 30th, NASA sent out the, the good night commands, which is why uh, I called the, the song Kepler Good Night, uh, which retired the mission and allowed Kepler to become a part of the infinite space that it set out to explore. Uh, so this piece of music was inspired by by the hope and adventure that was embodied in, in Kepler and, and the team of incredible human beings that made it possible. Around Christmas time, I, I continued my annual tradition of recording a Christmas song, uh, inspired by my two sweet daughters, Lily and Iris, and their truly undying love for, for Disney's Frozen. I, I chose to cover When We're Together, which was originally sung by Anna and Elsa from Frozen uh, in the Disney holiday short, Olaf's Frozen Adventure. Um, and I had so much fun recording this, I even got my little girls and my wife, Kate, to sing on the song. But when we're together And my favorite gift is you I would travel miles and miles And I would follow any star Shortly after that, also in December, I released another piece of music for my astronomy series. This one was called December 17th, 2018, Far Out. And that was written to honor the, the recent discovery of the most distant solar system object ever observed, uh, which astronomers nicknamed perfectly Far Out. I just love that name. Uh, it's a small pinkish dwarf planet located in the outer reaches of the solar system. And Far Out is roughly 310 miles in diameter, so this song is 3 minutes and 10 seconds in length. Okay, and lastly, I released a new cover song just a couple weeks ago. I had the honor of covering Patty Griffin's gorgeous song, When It Don't Come Easy, for Grey's Anatomy, who were kind enough to debut the song on the show just a couple weeks ago, and they also were uh, sweet enough to let my Enneagram song one air on the following week's episode as well. So huge thanks to uh, Team Grey's. Red lights flashing on the highway I wonder if we're gonna ever get home I wonder if we're gonna ever get home tonight. 
And of course, all of that new music everywhere is out everywhere now. And uh, I'll go ahead and toss some links into the show notes. Um, uh, 2018 was a really, really special year for Sleeping At Last. So thank you so much for all the ways that you made that so. I, I deeply appreciate you. So that entirely brings us up to speed. Uh, so let's, let's talk about all things Enneagram Type 8. And, and per usual, let's begin by talking about the type. So, so today we are recording with my dear friend Chris Hewitts again, who is, has been so kind uh, and has offered us this just incredible insight and wisdom into each of these nine Enneagram types as, uh, as these songs come out and as these podcasts come out. So um, Chris is here with us again. So Chris, how are you? Ryan, it's uh, great to hear your voice, um, and it's actually warming me up. We are freezing in Omaha. I think uh, you guys have it worse there in Chicago, but uh, when I woke up this morning, it was negative 33 wind chill, and I've never, ever seen my puppy suffer so much. <laughs> I think it's actually, it's it's kind of a beautiful tradition that we talk about your puppy, Basil, uh, at the beginnings of every podcast. That's It's kind of my favorite thing. I should say, Chris, how are you? But first, how's Basil? <laughs> <laughs> Poor guy. He's he's okay now. We're inside. But man, he was shaking so hard. Oh, poor little dude. Yeah, as of recording this, it was minus 25 degrees in Chicago and a wind chill of minus 50 degrees, which is just completely nuts. And just makes me rethink why I live in the Midwest and not somewhere uh, on the West Coast. Oh, boy, for sure. But you know what? This is actually the perfect day to record a, a podcast on type eights because um, the need for intensity in all things is one of the <laughs> things that helps eights feel alive. And uh, and so this is this is probably willed by the universe on us in terms of the, the timing. <laughs> I love that. So what's special about this episode is that we're talking about the type that Chris happens to identify as. So Chris, you are a uh, dominant in Enneagram type eight. Yeah. So I am an eight. And uh, for a lot of eights, we usually, when we bring type forward or, or, or we out or admit or, conf you know, for eights, we feel like we have to confess our type. Um, it often sort of feels like it has to come with an apology because a lot of people will say something to the effect of, oh, yeah, I used to know a really unhealthy eight. And <laughs> right. you never hear people say that about the other types. And so usually I respond with, no, I, I think they were just an eight. You probably just didn't stand up for yourself. And that doesn't help the introduction or the sort of welcoming of eights bringing type forward. But I, I do think this is one of the the types that has um, been also misunderstood um, can come across or maybe, let's say, misrepresent or mispresent the best of itself. And, and this is one of the types that um, folks have a hard time sort of knowing how to relate to and, and, and knowing how to internalize what it is that the eights on a subconscious level are, are bringing forward, even if they, they think they're gifting forward parts of themselves. And something you and I had talked about before pressing record here is that eights get this truly unfair shake in, when it comes to being talked about in the Enneagram. I feel like all the other types, we, we do this, uh, as you've mentioned, we, we talk about the caricature. Uh, it's easier, of course, to point to the struggles of each type than it is to point to the, the redemption or, or the strength of each type. But I feel like eights, uh, eights get dragged through the mud. They really, really do. And as I was researching and, and reading everything I could about the type, I, w I was really kind of bummed out about how negative the teaching on the Enneagram type eight uh, tends to be, at least initially. I feel like it gets to the strengths and it gets to the the, the growth of, of the type, but uh, mostly it just starts in a pretty negative place. I wonder if the, the initial response from non-eights to eights is, is kind of a defensive stance or defensive posturing, be, because there is an intensity, there is a too muchness, there, there is a sort of coming at and a coming against folks that almost requires them to sort of pull up, let's say, sort of a, a, an emotional shield. Now, I, I think there's a, a couple things happening here with that. And number one, I, I just think it's energy mirroring energy. And, and eights wouldn't want folks to know this, but but eights are, are perpetually sort of in a defensive stance, always sort of assuming they're going to be betrayed or sold out, always assuming that somebody is going to try to exert control over them, um, always sort of on a subconscious level, again, sort of fearful that they're going to to sort of have to concede their power to, to someone that they don't trust. And so I, I think this sort of defensiveness, calling to defensiveness is, is happening. 
um, sort of behind the scenes. But I, I also wonder here if this is sometimes the sort of like, let's say, karmic response of, yeah, eights get dragged a lot and we want to act like it doesn't bother us and we want to act like we have thicker skin than we do. But it's because we're also dragging the folks that, that we don't respect, the folks that we, we, we have a hard time looking up to, but also the folks that in a, in a sort of junior high-esque sense that, that we want to test to see if they'll actually stay in the game with us, to, to test them to see if they'll actually love us and, and not walk away from us. And so there's something really tricky going on here. And the bummer is, um, we'll sort of see this as, as we sort of kick these thoughts around. The inability for eights to practice vulnerability keeps them from being honest about all of these all of these sort of low low key things that are happening. Like I said, maybe maybe behind the scenes. As a as a type eight, do you feel like uh, I mean, obviously you've traveled all over the world to to talk about the enneagram. Uh, is it is it difficult for you to talk about the type, at least from the experience of being one yourself? Is it is it hard to be vulnerable in that way? Yeah, so this was this was pretty hard for me early on because um how how the enneagram used to be taught and and I think to a large extent there are still people out there who bring it forward through through the negative aspects of of type structure or or personality. It used to sort of feel like man the eights are just the worst of the worst here and um you know you you see that show up in 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 some of the the the, the hardcore enneagram meme games on Instagram or, or some of the, the playful podcasts that are out there. But uh, man, it's, it's, it's taken me a long time to, to actually sort of nurture true compassion for, for these sort of hard edges of myself. And it's taken me a long time to realize like, we all have them. We just have nine different ways of disguising them, nine different ways of, of hiding them. And so, um, you know, part of my own inner works, part of my own soul work here has been learning to love myself. And, 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 and this is true, right? For all nine types, if, if you can't love the best and the worst of yourself, and if you can't find compassion for your own type, then this is where you're going to just project your frustrations and irritations and, and, and dislikes onto other types without knowing that this is your own shadow and this is the own part of your shadow that you, you don't want to contend with. So it used to be a lot harder for me. Um, now I can find a, a little bit of a, a sense of humor about it and, 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 and a little bit of levity about it. But I also feel like I can, can find tremendous compassion here because we'll see this, that eights are not as, as tough as they come across. There, there really is a vulnerability and a tenderness that they're trying to protect, that they don't want to, to sort of expose or share or, or introduce even to, to people in, in their most significant relationships. Man, that's really beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, so you've already given us so much insight into who Enneagram type eights are. Uh, but for folks that are listening that are unfamiliar with the Enneagram and uh, the Enneagram type eight, can you give us an in the nutshell description of who these people are? Sure. So type eights um, are, are sort of traditionally known as as the challengers. And, and I sometimes like to take that language and, and, and even sort of mold it into the contrarians, right? This is the need to be against these are, are are really intense, driven people who who just have an, a natural initiating drive within them, and so they hate to be slowed down. They hate to be interrupted. Um, they relate to, to power very differently than than most of the other other enneagram types, and and they relate to that through provocation, and and this is how they build intimacy, and this is how they build trust through. Through, through fighting, through conflict, through sort of sass and, and, and hassling people. They're really independent. They, they come across really determined and, and they come across, I think, stronger than, than they often are. They, they can also come across a, a little more disconnected, I think, than, than they mean to. They vacillate between a kind of, of, of tolerance and intolerance. And, and so they, they tolerate things that, that most people wouldn't, especially things that that may be perceived as as, as vulgar or, or inappropriate. But what they have an intolerance for is the exploitation of weakness outside of themselves. And, and so these are the folks who, who become incredible humanitarians, like who, who really sort of go after um, wherever they see vulnerability being taken advantage of. 
eights are, are 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 really assertive. They, like I said, they 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 sometimes present as as confident or overly confident. Pretty tough, even though there's there's a tenderness in there. And uh, you know, they're they're the kind of person that you you want to be on their side. You want them to to have your back. You want them to be able to to look out and 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 take care of you in the end. And and how they'll take care of you won't be really sort of in in, in nurturing ways, but really in, in very protective ways. As we relate to types, I I, I usually find it actually the most compassionate way to understand types through through looking at the pains in and and some of these were real and some of these were simply misperceptions that come from our early holding environments and so what we learn about folks who are dominant in type 8 is, is that there was a a kind of rejection experience in in relationship to the to the nurturing caregiver or the nurturing parent now this is it's not complicated but but it's really one of those painful sort of accidents of, of, of missing each other, which really becomes sort of a, a tragic loss of love, per se. So eights have this, this, this pronounced need to, to be in control and to maintain control, to, to protect themselves. And you see this projected outside of their, themselves in that protective stance that they take in relationships. But as little kids... When that nurturing caregiver was was coming at them, it felt like a kind of manipulative approach to controlling them. And this is because eights are disconnected from their heart center, so they don't know what to do with their feelings or emotions. And so when the heart of the nursing parent came, and it came really, let's say, intensely or intimately or or sensitively, the eight rejected it. And and in rejecting that, um, misunderstood that, and and it had to double down on on a self-protective stance. And, and so I'll, I'll be real, real candid here. You know, my mom was 19 years old when, when she was pregnant with me. Um, I was her first child. I think my mother's a two. And she just was so happy to be a mom. She was just so happy to have a, a, a little boy. And, and when she brought all that two-ness and all the love of, of that two-ness forward, even as a little kid, it felt like too much for me. It felt like something I, I, I didn't know what to do or make sense of. And so I sort of, in a sense, stiff-armed it. And, and this was the real great ache and pain of, of, of my mother's and I relationship over the years is all she wanted to do was take care of me. And all I wanted to do was not be controlled or smothered or manipulated by, by her love. And, and so for a lot of eights, there's, there has to be a kind of, of healing and, and a reckoning with our willingness to actually receive and accept love. Now, a, another aspect of the imperfect early holding environments of eights has to do with a snapshot of their childhood, a snapshot of their of their growing up where they felt like they had to actually be tougher, be more mature, be older than they actually were. And this an accelerating of part of their childhood, this having to grow up too fast created a, a kind of toughness in a lot of eights that sort of becomes the muscle memory of, of, of again, how they present. But you'll see this in their adult lives there are these sort of glimpses or snapshots or, or, or periods of what they may not give language to, but are sort of the lost memories of their childhood, where now as an adult, they're, they're going to sort of try to relate to it in a sort of playful or affectionate or, or, or even sort of an, an obsessive way. And so you see a lot of eights with their Star Wars toys or their Care Bear or their My Little Pony collections or there's a, a fixation on a certain kind of film or story or childhood book that they read, or there's something that returns them to that part of their childhood that was accelerated, their part of that childhood that, that seemed to be lost, that eights actually need to sort of relive into and, and to sort of bring forward. They, in a sense, they need to metabolize that part of their childhood that, that, that seemed to, to be missing. Because, like I said, in having to grow up too fast, it, it created a kind of, of, of strength in them that was you know, maybe unnecessary and, and for them to be the little kid and, and to, to sort of be reintroduced to their inner child is, is part of how they're going to be healed. Uh, Chris, thank you so much for, for painting such a, a helpful and, and vivid picture of the Enneagram type eight for us. It is invaluable to, uh, to understand those things about the type before hearing this song. And uh, it is just, just really beautiful to hear it from your perspective as a type eight. 
So thank you so much. Uh, and I've mentioned uh, in each of these Enneagram episodes that Chris is the author of my absolute favorite Enneagram book called The Sacred Enneagram. So if you don't already have it, I can't encourage you enough to go pick it up. It is the most compassionate and, and beautiful and loving perspective on the Enneagram uh, that exists. So we're going to hear a bunch more from Chris uh, throughout the episode, but I would love to share my my song with you guys. This is my my humble attempt at trying to capture at least a little part of the essence of the, the Enneagram Type 8. I am so honored to share it with you. And if you happen to identify as a Type 8, uh, I hope that this song contains at, at least a speck of who you are and then it amplifies the, the goodness and strength and, and beauty that you possess. Uh, also that you feel understood and, and valued. And, and most of all, I, I so hope that you feel respected and honored by this song. Uh, and this might be totally cliche to, to ask, but uh, this song was meant to be heard as loud as you feel comfortable with. Uh, I, I wrote and recorded it with the intention that the volume would be turned up. Uh, every time I was working on anything on this song, it was always a click or two above the, the comfortable hearing level. <laughs> so, uh, which of course is a nod to, to that intensity that the, the eights are capable of. So if you're up for it, listen, listen as loud as you're able to. All right, here is eight. I remember the minute Was like a switch was flipped Was just a kid Who grew up strong enough to pick this armor up And suddenly fit God, that was so long ago, long ago, long ago I was little, I was weak and perfectly naive And I grew up too quick Now you won't see all that I have to lose And all I've lost in the fight to protect it I won't let you in I swear never again I can't afford, no I refuse to be I want to break these bones till they're better I want to break them right and feel alive You were wrong, you were wrong, you were wrong My healing needed more than time When I see fragile things, helpless things, broken things I see the familiar I was little, I was weak, I was perfect too Now I'm a broken mirror But I can't let you see All that I have to lose All I've lost in the fight to protect it I can't let you in I swore never again I can't afford to let myself be blindsided I'm sending God, I'm falling apart And all I want is to trust you Show me how to lay my soul down Do you want to I'm just a kid who grew up scared enough to hold the door shut and bury my innocence. But here's a map, here's a shovel, here's my Achilles heel. I'm all in palms out, I'm at your mercy now, and I'm ready to begin. I am strong, I am strong, I am strong enough to let you
So no matter how many songs I write, I'm I'm still absolutely terrified to show anybody. Um, gosh, I hope that if you happen to identify as a type eight, that something in there resonated with, with who you are and uh, that you felt honored. It's incredibly hard to fit any of these nine personality types into a single song. But I will say that the the intensity and the strength and the um, the power of of a type eight uh, is is pretty darn hard to fit into a song, like fitting uh, the ocean inside a cup. Uh, but I, I sure do enjoy the challenge and the the privilege that it is to to even try. Uh, so well before a single note or a lyric was written down for this song, uh, I had a concept in mind for for the Type 8 song. I had written it down uh, probably at the very beginning of even thinking through uh, the Enneagram songs at all. And I was absolutely confident that this idea would be uh, the, the guiding light of writing this song. I wanted this song to be the opposite of what you would expect. You learn about the type and it's this dynamic and strong strong and powerful, intense type. And I thought, wouldn't it be interesting to kind of do what an eight would do and kind of go against the grain a little bit. And rather than this, this big, powerful song, maybe it should be the, the sweetest and, and softest song on the Enneagram collection. And I, I really held on to this idea. I, I remember even talking to several of my type eight friends who always had a raised eyebrow every time I mentioned this concept. I'm like, it's going to be super sensitive and sweet, and it's going to be all really, really gentle instrumentation. And I just felt really certain that was the, the correct direction for the song all the way up until the, the moment I started researching to actually write the song uh, that I realized that that's entirely the wrong direction. These are these are nine stories of redemption, as I've said on each of these Enneagram episodes. Each type's song should should magnify or amplify the, the strengths and the qualities of each type. So for the type eight, uh, though gentleness and sensitivity are, are a part of the equation, it's just not the full story. Uh, the, their strength, their power, uh, their intensity, those things are, are so, so much a part of their redemption and, and their integration. Uh, so I wanted to write something that honors all aspects of the type eight, the, the strength, the, the softness of their inner child, the intensity, and, and of course, the, the beauty of, of who the, the type eights are. Uh, and so realizing that my initial concept was just not quite right really changed the trajectory of, of this song and its tone. So uh, as with every song that I write, I, I find that it's really, really helpful for me to uh, to kind of jot down some internal rules for the song. Uh, so obviously I have the theme in mind already, which is already a creative jumping off point, but I, I find that laying out these rules, whether it's production rules or, or lyric rules, uh, are just a really helpful guiding light in the process of writing these songs. Uh, any idea that I come up with, I sort of hold it up against these rules and uh, see if I'm allowed to uh, pursue that direction or another. So. This practice has been so helpful uh, in the writing process of all of my music, but especially these, these Enneagram songs. So I'd love to share with you guys a bunch of the, the rules that I uh, stuck to throughout the writing of the song. Okay, so rule number one was to go big and dynamic as possible whenever possible. Uh, and this was a rule for production, for vocabulary, and, and of course the, the general shape of the song. Um, so in one moment I'm, I'm layering as much as I possibly can and then everything will drop out in the next and uh, it'll just be a, a super close up and intimate vocal with a, with a small piano. But I can't let you see all that I have. So I really tried to write as many peaks and valleys throughout the song as I possibly could. In Beatrice Chestnut's book, The Enneagram, uh, she says that the eight superpower is superpower. And I totally, totally love that. Uh, so I kept that in mind in the writing of every element in the song. All right, so the next rule that I wrote down was to stay ahead of the beat almost always. So this is obviously a rule of tempo, uh, and I just wanted to always push that tempo forward uh, against the, the kind of the grain of the song. And, and this little rule is to reflect the, the intensity, but also the, maybe the impatience of, of the type eight. Uh, and, and Father Richard Rohr uh, assigns a need to each of the nine types, and for the eight, it is the need to be against. Uh, so by pushing against the tempo, uh, that was my nod to uh, the, the type 8's need to be against. 
Uh, so the next rule was a, a lyric rule, and that was to include as many verbs as I possibly could. Uh, and, and the more I thought about this, the more I realized that uh, type sevens and type eights uh, are essentially real life living, breathing verbs. <laughs> so if you listen to the lyrics of either uh, seven or eight, you will hear verbs galore. There's a, there's a pretty high verb count on, uh, <laughs> on each of those songs. Uh, so another rule that I had a lot of fun playing around with musically was to use dissonance as much as I could. Um, I traditionally love melody and I love harmony, and so um, dissonance plays a very small role in in most of my music. Uh, but for this one, I thought it'd be really fun to allow dissonance in more frequently than I than I typically do. So uh, a decent example of what I'm talking about is in the the writing of the chorus. But I can't let you see. All that I have to lose. So you can kind of hear in the, especially the beginning of that. Da, da, da. That's super against the grain of the chords. So the piano, I'll play it all on the piano for you to hear. So I'm playing at the same time all of these notes. Uh, and, and so as the story of this this type 8 character moves along in the song, uh, the dissonance actually kind of lets up a little bit throughout. Uh, so there's more resolve and, and more resolution and harmony uh, by the time that the song ends. All right, so there's a bunch of other rules, and we will get to each of them throughout the podcast. But I would love to take a, a little bit of a detour and, and just talk about the, the song and as a whole and how, uh, how it came together. So I'm going to be totally honest about writing this song. It, it was a monster to write. I, I mean, it, it, it was difficult uh, for literally the entire time uh, until I was just about to the finish line and uh, pieces started clicking into place. But I like to think of writing songs as a, a sort of a wrestling match. And uh, I was real intimidated by this particular opponent. Type eight was a, was a real, a real difficult wrestling partner. And I, I think the hardest part of writing the song was just lyrically. Uh, I actually, and this has never really happened to me before in writing songs, but I, I finished the lyrics and then uh, went to bed feeling really good about it. And then I woke up the next morning and had an honest look at what I had written and uh, a, a very defeated voice inside my head just kept telling me, this is not right. This is not right. And so I went back to the drawing board and uh, continued to just keep at it. And I'm really glad that I did because I feel like um, this song needed to be broken uh, a bunch of times in order for it to, to feel right to me. Uh, and thankfully, after deleting half of what I had written and rearranging or rewriting the rest of it, uh, it the rest of the pieces came together fairly quickly. So it was a very sobering moment of realizing that this this wasn't quite right. And then uh, thankfully the, the path forward was a little bit illuminated for me. And once I finally felt really good about everything, uh, <laughs> the irony sunk in that the very first lyrics that I wrote for the song were... I wanna break these bones till they're better. I wanna break them right. I just couldn't believe that the the instructions <laughs> of how to fix the song that wasn't working was literally written down in the lyrics. Uh, I, I needed to break this song uh, until it was better. Uh, and a total side note, when I sing those lyrics, I actually I cracked my knuckles and I recorded my wife cracking her knuckles too. So, I, <laughs> so there is the real sound of bones, I guess, technically not breaking, but they are cracking in that moment of the song. I'm not even totally sure I should have shared that with you because <laughs> that is kind of gross. So most of my very closest friends happen to be eight. Uh, so apparently I have a friend type. <laughs> but it was a really, really helpful resource in the writing of this song because anytime I, I had a, a real specific question, I could call somebody and, and ask directly. Uh, and one thing kept standing out to me in, in these conversations and in some of my research is that there was this, uh, this turning point or this moment that, that type eights could, could recall uh, when they actively decided to uh, think a different way or almost like a pivotal moment kept coming up in, in these different conversations. Uh, and I just thought that was really, really interesting that it was such a vivid memory for uh, for most of the eights that I was talking to. I, I don't think I've come across anything like that in researching any of the other Enneagram types. That's what inspired these opening lyrics. I remember the minute It was like a switch was flipped 
Mm-hmm. So it's a, a reference not only to the moment that the the kind of the turning point in in a type eight's life, but it's uh, I think it ties into the the childhood wound. So it felt like the right the right place to start from. Uh, and the beginning of the song here is actually another example of uh, another rule that I set out for myself, uh, and it's just the word staccato. Uh, I wanted it to be staccato whenever possible. Uh, and for those of you that don't know, the definition of staccato is with each note or sound sharply detached or separated from the others, a staccato rhythm. Uh, so in this story of redemption, I felt like the first half should uh, have as many uh, non-sustaining notes as possible. Uh, and a, a better way to look at staccato is almost like these these musical stabs uh, so the notes are, are very quick and um, they happen immediately uh, and I just I thought that the abrupt nature of staccato instrumentation was was really interesting for the type 8 uh, especially in the beginning um, so uh, yeah that's also uh, led to the decision of starting right on the vocal which is something that I don't do very often I always like for the the musical palette to kind of set a tone first and then uh, have the vocal lay on top uh, but this song it felt like it needed to start and end and as abruptly as possible. So you'll notice the beginning starts like this. I remember the minute. And then the song ends with uh, at the loudest peak. <laughs> so even though the word of my rule was staccato, uh, it probably makes more sense to have called that rule abrupt. Oh, and a small side note, um, those staccato strings that you hear throughout this song are meant to be a connection to the, the Type 2 song, where you also hear some staccato strings. The, the Type 8 integrates to a Type 2, so at their best, they, uh, they borrow some of the, the healthy and beautiful traits of the two. And so I thought that that was a fun way to kind of uh, represent the connection path between the two types. So type 8 integrate to a type 2, but they disintegrate to a, a type 5. And so there's a, a very, very slight nod in, to that disintegration path in, in the opening lyrics of this song. Uh, but first, let's listen to the, the lyric that it connects to in the type 5 song. And then the opening lyrics of this song include... Just a kid who grew up strong enough to pick this armor up. And suddenly so you have the type five laying down their armor as they as they get healthier and then at the beginning of the eight song you have the character picking it up and the armor that language applies to pretty much every type because I, I do feel like the more i learn the more i realize that all nine types are just nine different ways of of picking up our armor and as we are healthy and we grow, it's nine different ways of laying our armor down. But the literal image of armor felt really, really appropriate for the type five and for the type eight specifically. Uh, so because eights are a part of the body intelligence center, I, I wrote a list out of a ton of words that I wanted to try to include into the song somehow. Um, uh, mostly verbs, as I mentioned, uh, but uh, words that just had a physicality to it. So push, pull, fight, wait might, break, blindsided, guard, bones, pry, strong, shatter, spill. And I was able to get all of those words in, uh, into different lines. And it was just a lot of fun to try to make that connection to the, the body intelligence center. So let's go ahead and dive in a little deeper with Chris on the Enneagram type eight. So if we're gonna look at the, the classical type structure um, really from, from the early raw materials from Oscar Chasso and then what Claudio Naranjo did to trick that out into type. You have to remember that the eights are located in their body, right, their gut center. And so these are the folks that experience life as, as too much, and, and, and the eights, nines, and ones sort of share this experience. The eights take that too muchness and, and fight back. The nines sort of look at that too muchness and, and, and withdraw in a sense, and the ones try to organize it or fix it or, or curate it into something good. That intelligence center for the eights also, um, if you can remember this from our conversations with type ones, shows us our most accessible emotion, which for the eights is, is a kind of frustration or anger. And that's the static noise, everything and everyone is sort of testing our last nerve and, and just bringing us to the edge of sort of expressing a little bit of that, that anger. The eights 
a holy idea here, and, and our holy idea is our unobstructed view of reality. This is what Hamid Ali says. I, I think when you talk about the holy ideas, it's the most urgent truth that you need to tell yourself. And, and for the eights, in fact, it is holy truth. And, and this holy truth really has to speak to the, the, the charity of, of oneness and, and, and to, the, to the connection of, of what eights need to sort of fall into, which is love. And, and like I said, that love is, is, is the love that they, in a sense, resist, but, but need, need to receive as a way of getting back in touch with their hearts. The holy idea um, is, is the sort of counterpoint, let's say, to the virtue. And so if the holy idea is sort of higher intellectual state, the virtue is the higher emotional state of each of the types. And the, and the virtue for the eight is innocence. And, and this innocence um, is really a return to the inner child. And, and this is why you see eights um, relate to children or, or, or puppies or, or things that are tender with, with such, so it's clumsy, it, it's endearing, but but man, it's really, really honest too. And And I'll say this. When, when eights are around a child or when I'm with my puppy, it's like, I don't have to control this child. I don't have to fight with my dog. And it becomes a kind of mirror to giving me the permission to return to my own vulnerabilities. Um, the passion for the eight has, has been um, described as lust. And, and this isn't sort of a sensual, lusty, sexualized kind of lust, but, but this is really a lust for intensity. And, and so this is really experienced in the gut as, as, as desire and, and eights are, are are really driven to to sort of attain and 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 and, and consume whatever it is that they desire. Um, this this passion is also sort of suffered in in the hearts of the eights as as excess and and it's as if there's almost never enough of what it is that they desire. And this is where you can sort of see the enneagram as a color wheel, right? That gluttony of the seven sort of folding into the excessiveness of the eight. But man, this this passion is, is is really sort of unthought through in, in the minds of the eights, and so that's kind of an unconsequence thinking, or, or there's a real sort of strong impulsiveness there. Now, the the, the mental fixation of the eights is vengeance, and, and and I'll say this, man, eights can can beat themselves up, and this is where compassion is really important for eights. Eights can be really hard on themselves, and if an eight is honest about bumping around on the bottom of life or, or facing the consequences of their own failures, nobody's going to punish them harder than they punish themselves. But like all of us, right, we, we take this fixation and, and we aim it inward and, and then we project it outward. And, and man, when eights sort of practice and perfect um, vengeance inside, this is where that, that vengeance, that protective stance, that, that taking care of people in their lives or their, their loved ones or communities really shows up as is, is that defender of, of those that they care for. Now, you may have come across something called the harmonic groups, and um, I love what, what Russ Hudson at the Enneagram Institute has done with these. Um, I, I once heard him talk about these as conflict avoidance styles. And when you look at the, the harmonic groups for, for type A, what you see is that their sort of conflict avoidance tactic, which sounds ridiculous because eights are, are constantly, in a sense, looking for conflict to sort of feel alive. And, and this comes back to their, their type's basic desire. Well, the, the conflict avoidance tactic or style for the eight is actually emotional intensity here, emotional realness. And, and, and it's a kind of discharging what's up setting them, frustrating them, uh, annoying or irritating them. They just got to get it off their chest. It's just like they have to smash the horn or they just have to blurt out the curse word and, and then they're fine. For most other people that who are eights, that doesn't feel like conflict avoidance. That actually feels like they're being drawn into conflict. And so if you're in a relationship with an eight, um, I, I, I recommend that you, you push back, that, that you receive the discharge, that you validate it. Um, but you you push back a little bit that you 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 sort of give them the same kind of intensity that they're giving you and 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 what that does for them is it helps them feel heard and once they feel heard what you can do is correct it you can help them realize like all right now you you may need to see this differently or hey it's not as bad as you think or let's really get to the bottom of this and uh, that's one way to sort of work work well with them so one of the things that often confuses people about eights, and, and this is actually something eights generally are unaware of uh, about themselves, is that they use vulgarity or inappropriate language as a, as a way of sort of testing people, right? So 
I know a lot of eights are really fluent in curse words and, and love to, to, to say f and, and when they actually drop the F-bomb, what they're doing is they're stomping on the ice, in a sense, between you and them to test how thick it is. And, and, and if the f word is what actually breaks that ice, if, if their vulgarity in, in an appropriate language is actually what causes you to sort of back off or step away, then great. For them, that was efficient. There was kind of a, a, an expediency in that because what eights are, are really afraid of is that at a certain point, they're going to be betrayed or at a certain point, there's going to be something that's out of the too muchness of their own drive and intensity that's going to cause people to, to, to betray them or walk away from or, or leave them in relationships. And, and eights don't want to be honest about that. And, and so they guise or they disguise or they mask their sadness through, through anger and um, and that anger comes comes across also in a very compatible ways. So if if you're around eights and they're using vulgarity or or if they're they're using inappropriate language, on a subconscious level they don't know this about themselves, but they're testing you and they're testing you to see are are you going to stay in the game with them? Are you going to continue to take them seriously, or is that it? Did that sort of just blow you off? And is, was that the deal breaker? <laughs> okay, bleeping out Chris's F words uh, might be the highlight of making this podcast. <laughs> I told Chris I was going to do it, and uh, he thought that was perfect, that a nine was trying to censor an eight. <laughs> and he said that it would it would make uh, other type eights uh, pretty angry. So if, if that happened, <laughs> my apologies. And to pay tribute to uh, the the eights affinity with uh, with swearing, I, I use the word swore uh, in the lyric. I can't let you in. I swore never again. Uh, so the vocal melody of this song, I, I I wanted to write something as dynamic as possible to kind of fit into that earlier rule that I mentioned. Uh, but uh, it was really important for me to write at the very top of my range. Uh, so when I'm belting it out in the song, uh, that's at the, the the breaking point of my voice, where if it was just even a, a half note up, it would crack. And so uh, it, that was, of course, a challenge to record and to, to feel good about the takes uh, when, when you feel like your range is almost out of control, uh, but it also helped me feel the song. Uh, so I think that what happens when, when you're working on music is that you, you've worked on it for weeks on end, and uh, you, you're always trying to come back to the thread or the, the excitement of the original spark of, of the thing. Um, and so I think singing in this range, singing uh, as with my whole heart, uh, it, it actually helped me to uh, kind of stay connected to that feeling. But I did have an experience that I've, I don't think I've ever had uh, in singing vocal takes, which is that I almost blacked out. Uh, so after, I think it was two different takes, uh, I was singing at the very end uh, with all that I had, and <laughs> I totally got lightheaded and needed to lay on the floor for uh, for a minute or two after those takes. So I guess trying to channel that that intensity uh, of the type eight, uh, it was it was definitely a very visceral experience to uh, to perform the song oh and, and the take that i nearly blacked out after uh that's that's what you hear in the song so another way that I wanted to reflect the the intensity and the the, the all in aspect of the type eight was to uh, in, in the lyrics to say the word all as much as possible. Usually the word all is kind of a generic word. Uh, it, it it can be used sparingly and be effective, but um, for this one, I feel like eights really mean it when they say all. It, it's a uh, it, it comes from that intensity, and so I think I, I I sing the word all maybe seven or eight times in the song. I hope it's eight. <laughs> So I'd love to tell you about my guest type 8 band, uh, just a bunch of friends that identify as type 8 that were kind enough to lend me their musical talents. So first up is my big brother, Chad. Chad is one of my favorite drummers ever and people in the universe, uh, and I'm so thankful that he was kind enough to play on this song. Uh, Chad lives with his sweet family in Nashville where uh, he recorded these drums, and I absolutely love what they bring to the dynamics of this song. At the risk of dating myself and, and Chad, uh, for those of you that have heard the Ghost album or Keep No Score, Chad's drums should be a, a very familiar sound in the Sleeping At Last universe. Chad and his drums play a huge role in the history of Sleeping At Last, uh, so it meant a lot to have him play on this song. Uh, and I can't wait to make more music together. So a huge thanks to Chad. Seriously, so, so grateful for you. 
So the next member of my type eight guest band is uh, my, my dear friend, David Hodges, who is one of the most talented songwriters and musicians I've ever met and uh, truly one of my favorite people. He and I have been friends for uh, about a decade now and uh, was really, really grateful that he uh, took time to record some instruments. He recorded a little bit of acoustic guitar and he recorded a little bit of a Wurlitzer and a couple miscellaneous sounds. Thank you so much, David. My next guest is another dear friend of mine. This is Busby, who is also an insanely gifted songwriter, producer, musician, and just all around great dude. And apparently uh, an incredible trombone player. Uh, Busby was kind enough to play all of the trombones that you hear throughout the song. Thank you so much, Busby. I totally love that sound. Uh, something about it reminds me of Rocky. Uh, and a side note, I saw Creed too actually during the writing of this, which uh, helped pump me up to, uh, to write this song. Uh, and next up, I have my friend Daisy Klamala singing background vocals, and I love her voice, so talented, and uh, I love what it adds to this song. It gives this, this lightness and this, uh, this air that I really appreciate. <laughs> Uh, and lastly, we have strings, which uh, were played by two incredible players that brought my arrangement to life. Oh gosh, I could listen to them play all day. Uh, so the first player is Anya Gerber, and she played all of the violins that you hear. She played five different violin tracks and is such a talent. I've known Anya for about six or seven years now. I met her through her mom, Sharon Gerber, who is a longtime Sleeping At Last collaborator and has been on countless songs, and Anya has as well. Uh, and Anya, actually, at the time that we met, she and her mom were playing a, a show with me and were kind enough to be my, my string players. And uh, she was only about 13 or 14 years old, so she's a young talent and is absolutely amazing. And I'm so, so grateful that uh, she was kind enough to, to, to be my, my violin section on this song. So huge thanks, Anya. And last but certainly not least is uh, Sarah Maria Blanton, who played all of the viola that you hear on this song. Uh, and Sarah is actually a new friend of mine. We actually still have not met in person, but she was kind enough to uh, to send over a note uh, a few months back and offered up her amazing gifts as a string player. And so when I was looking for players to uh, to perform this arrangement, uh, I was I was delighted to find a viola player that was uh, so gifted. A huge thanks to Sarah for for making this work. We did all of this over email, and I'm looking forward to meeting her in person one day soon. Um, and also a huge thanks to her engineer friend, Jess Ray, who was kind enough to um, record all of these beautiful performances that uh, Sarah sent over. So uh, thank you so much to both of you guys. I'm truly honored. Uh, so something I really love about writing music is trying to figure out subtle ways in which the music or the notes being played can support the lyrics in some way. Uh, and not just in a melody sense, but um, if I'm talking about a specific thing, I want the music to kind of underline the, the, the meaning or the, uh, the words that I'm singing. So in this song, I had a lot of fun doing that. So I'll share a few examples of ways that the music supports what I'm lyrically talking about. Uh, so the string arrangement is kind of scattered throughout the song. It starts really sparse in these little uh, these little clusters, and then it uh, evolves and becomes bigger and and more consistent. Uh, and I kind of thought of the strings as the um, the character of innocence. So anytime uh, in the lyrics that I talk about any fragile things, broken things, uh, any anything like that, you'll hear the strings kind of peek into the mix. When I see fragile things, helpless things, broken things. Uh, and in the moment where I sing, I'm standing guard, I'm falling apart, uh, you hear the strings fall in the background. They, they kind of descend, uh, which is just a, a subtle nod to, to what I'm singing about. I'm standing guard, I'm falling apart, and 
Uh, so another example is when uh, the character is singing the word sword. Uh, the lyric is, show me how to lay my sword down. And uh, for that moment, there needed to be something metallic to kind of represent the sword. Uh, so I had my brother play the, the ride symbol there uh, to give the sense of metal. How to lay my sword down for Uh, another way that I wanted to musically emphasize vulnerability and um, the, the, the inner child is to change the, the verse chords to sound sweeter as they go. So in the beginning, they're like this. Uh, and then the same melody uh, goes over these chords as the, as the innocence kind of comes forward. So it's it's super subtle, but I, I think that hopefully you feel it as a, if you're paying attention to the words and you kind of are, are following the story. You, you kind of feel the the slightly more hopeful uh, feeling in those chords. Uh, another way that I, I sort of emphasize the inner child in the music is to use children's instruments in a real subtle way throughout um, the the middle to end sections of the song. I also had a ton of fun playing around with uh, effects on my on my vocal. It was really fun to kind of emphasize certain parts of the story. Uh, when uh, when I'm talking about vulnerability or I'm talking about innocence, uh, you'll notice that the the vocal is really really dry and kind of upfront. Uh, and the hope was to sound as bare and raw and and vulnerable as possible. Uh, and to, I wanted it to sound like a letting in. But here's a map. Here's a shovel. Is my Achilles heel? A quick side note: uh, the Achilles heel reference is uh, a little nod to Chris, who uh, loves Greek mythology and uh, is super versed in it. And so I wanted to have a little tiny nod to that. Uh, so in other moments of the song, the, the character is processing certain things, and so I added distance by adding uh, a lot of different reverb and room sound to the vocal. I won't let you in, I swear never again, I can't afford, no I refuse to be rejected. Uh, playing with like the room size always kind of feels like playing with depth of field, so... This one was really fun to uh, try to map out according to what I'm singing about and, and the, the trajectory of the story. Uh, so another way that I wanted the, the vulnerability to evolve in the character over the course of the song uh, is in, in a really, really subtle um, language use. Uh, so in the beginning, you'll hear the word I won't in the chorus, uh, and that's kind of an active decision. And, and slowly, as the song progresses and the character evolves, it starts to be I can't. So some of the similar lines later uh, will, will turn from I won't to I can't. Uh, and I can't just feels more vulnerable to me. Uh, it's like admitting that there's a limit. An example of this would be in, in the chorus one, uh, where I say, no, I refuse to be rejected. Uh, that's sort of power and, and dominance. But later, uh, with nearly the same lyrics, I can't let myself be blindsided, uh, which felt a little bit more innocent. Uh, and that felt like a window into the hurt that I think the type eights tend to hide. The word blindsided, that is a word that showed up almost everywhere that I researched the type eights. Uh, eights feel like they were blindsided at some point in their life and will absolutely not let that happen again. So uh, when, I, when I read that, when I read, uh, when I heard from different friends that that was an experience that they had, uh, just even in casual language, the word blindsided kept coming up. So I knew that I needed to, to weave that into the song in, in some way. Uh, so let's bring Chris back on, who's going to share some wisdom uh, for those of you that recognize yourself as type eights, as well as people in relationships with type eights. So in terms of communicating with eights, um, you know, they, they, they are, they're larger than life, right? Um, I generally don't try to do a lot of the physical takes or the sort of nonverbal cues or, or the gives of, of types, but, you know, Richard Rohr will sometimes say that eights blink the least of, of all nine types because there's this kind of intensity and gaze. Um, you'll sometimes hear or see that like uh, eights, like other types, carry a lot of their weight in their body because there's a kind of largeness uh, about them. And, and this speaks to sort of the boldness of, of who eights can be. 
when eights communicate, there's a lot of <laughs> there's a lot of opinion behind it, and 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 there's a lot of strength behind that. And and this is true even when they're silent. You you sort of pick up on the energy and the intensity of it. Um, the eights are, are are really going after high impact, and and they want to make that, and they want you to understand that. In fact, they want you to internalize it and feel it on a visceral level, like they feel it. Um, so this is important to realize because they're 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 often unaware at how they come across. They're often unaware that they can sometimes be in intimidating, overwhelming, over overbearing. That they can almost sometimes be too strong for some of their conversation partners. And this is where they they feel really misunderstood. That if they come across too strong or too much, that they have to dial part of themselves back, or they have to mute themselves, or they can't bring their whole selves into relationships. And so there's a kind of dance that has to happen here where they need to know that they have permission to show up and, and that they need to know when, when, when them showing up with sort of an unawareness creates problems that, that they will, will be able to hear that. But I'll say this, when, when they see weakness in others, when they, they see somebody sort of cowering or backing down, a, a lot of times when, when they're not well and when there's a lack of compassion for themselves, they're, they're going to bully that. They're going to go after that. They're going to kind of try to control it or, or manipulate it. And so sort of standing up against pushing back, owning your own strength, owning your own power and relationship with them is corrective for an A. It, it actually makes them own the, the, the inappropriateness of what's too much about how they can sometimes sometimes come across. Let me suggest a, a, a few sort of conscious areas for, for growth for, for folks who are eights to, to really be able to, to live into the, to, to the gift of, of their type because we, we need eights to, to bring their best forward. And, and so for me, the, the, the first lesson and, and maybe the hardest lesson is this movement from transparency to vulnerability, right? So you'll see this. You'll see eights using transparency as as kind of a, a self protective um, way of of keeping themselves from having to to experience intimacy. I, I sort of talk about this movement from transparency to vulnerability when I I think of the the Spanish matador's red cape sort of teasing the bull. And and when I talk about it like this, I, I sometimes say, look, I'll, I'll tell you all the horrible things about myself and all the worst mistakes I've ever made and all of my vulnerabilities and weaknesses and, and, and spectacular failures. Because if I can sort of narrate that to you, you, you somehow think, oh, well, we share something now and there's a, a kind of deeper connection that I, I didn't realize I had with you. Well, what happens when eights are, are, are being transparent is, number one, again, we're testing you like, oh, you did this or you said that or you thought this. Yeah, that's too much. I'm, I'm not sure I can stay in the game with you. But like I said, secondly, what eights are doing here is is maintaining control in relationships because we really don't want to have to press into our own hearts and and really sort of explore the emotional contours of, of, of our emotional side. So this word vulnerability comes from the Latin word for wound, and to be vulnerable means to be woundable. And, and when I can move from transparency to real vulnerability, what I'm honestly doing is I'm setting down the matador's cape, I'm setting down stories, I'm, I'm actually so softening this, this pushing against or this stiff arm that keeps people out, and I'm learning to submit and let someone in so that you could even wound my tenderness and my heart. And so this move from transparency to vulnerability is, is an important one. Secondly, eights really need to learn to tell themselves the truth with compassion, right? So this holy idea, holy truth for the eights sometimes comes across as, I'm just speaking the truth in love when there's actually no love in it and it's not the truth. It's, it's a kind of weaponizing an opinion. And so for eights, um, this is going to be devastating to our ego. This is going to be devastating to our, our, our type structure. But we have to learn to tell ourselves the truth. And we have to do this with tremendous compassion. We have to find ways to love ourselves and, and especially the worst part of ourselves that get caricatured the most in, in, in a lot of the Enneagram materials and, and, and through a lot of the Enneagram teachers. Thirdly, for eights, I, I, I think a growth curve here is, is to press into our hearts and to learn to explore the, the complexities of our emotions and, and, and to find our feelings as, as rails, as, 
as as on ramps to a, a, a more sort of grounded and and transformed way of being. Right there's there's something that eights resist about their own vulnerability and their own tenderness and their own perception of weakness, and and, and unfortunately this keeps us out of our hearts. But we have to learn that actually it is our heart where our true strength comes from, and it's in our heart that we know who we are and, and we allow ourselves to be loved. And, and then finally, I, I I think the the real sort of key for for spiritual work or soul work or inner work for people who are eights is learning to say yes to to stopping the drive to to fight to champion to sort of heal the world and and protect outside of ourselves what we perceive to be exploited and so in in my book the sacred enneagram i i I sort of phrase this out as consenting to stillness uh, agreeing to the stopping of everything that we project outside of ourselves so that in stillness we we can learn to hear ourselves um, learn to explore our emotions learn to find compassion and learn to be truthful with with our own vulnerability so as i was talking to chris and uh, was asking him to share his thoughts and advice uh, to to people in relationship with type 8s uh, i had the thought that it'd be really interesting to uh, talk to his wife felina uh, to share a few thoughts on this as well um, felina is a dear friend uh, to my wife and i and um, she was sweet enough to agree to a totally out of the blue uh, recorded chat uh, so this is felina hewerts and uh, she's an author speaker teacher uh, yoga instructor Uh, And she has a brand new book that just came out called Mindful Silence and a revised edition of her beautiful book, uh, Pilgrimage of the Soul. I'll have links in the show notes, of course, uh, but I encourage you to pick them up. I I think it'll do your soul some good. Uh, So in our chat, I asked Felina if she wouldn't mind sharing some some thoughts or encouragements to folks that are in relationships with type 8s. So the first thing that comes to mind is not backing down. Uh, early on in our relationship, yeah, I learned how critical it was to stand up to him. Uh, so, you know, eights tend to come across with a lot of energy. They take up a lot of space. They tend to have a lot of opinions. They're, they have a force to be reckoned with. And, and I think some people tend to be intimidated by that. But if I if I could be so vain, you know, I think he met his match in me. It's like, <laughs> it's like, I'm not going to back down. Like I'm going to, you know, meet you where you're at. And, um, that sense of like eights tend to, um, they, they test people's love and trust, um, to the degree that that person can really hang in there with them, kind of fight with them. And it doesn't have to be an overt fight. It's more of an energetic kind of, you know, connection and, uh, and so that's been really important. And I think it was important for me too, you know, like it really helped me grow in a lot of ways. Oh, that's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, have you and Chris found ways in your relationship to invite his vulnerability or uh, his inner child to the table? Uh, I guess another way of asking that would be, um, have you found ways to help soften the, the protective stance of the eight? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I love this question. Uh, this is something that Chris and I continue to learn more and more about. There's been this um, importance of like giving him space. So like when he's in the moment, he's he can be fairly intense. So like if there's conflict or something like that, uh, giving him space, kind of letting the intensity flow out of him without me reacting and then give him space to like get underneath that and then come back to me from a softer place. But hopefully Chris will listen to this podcast and heed the advice I'm about to give on helping eights soften more. Uh, I'm thinking about like practices of sobriety, awakeness, awareness, um, practices that help the eight go inside. So interior kinds of practices Um, to help them not only soften, but then to regulate that intensity. So yeah, so like some practical practices to consider would be things like um, any kind of somatic body practice um, that also helps activate the emotional center. So yoga, um, even things like more intense things like kickboxing or boxing, or I know some eights have found like fighting 
whatever that is, I don't even know the sport, but you know, the really intense like contact sport of fighting, um, to be important to like, let that energy, that intense energy move through them. It kind of, I think breaks down the, the exterior barrier and then martial arts. And then there's, there's something called focusing, which is a spiritual practice. It's really interesting. There's some wonderful material that's been written on it that, um, that helps one pay attention to their body to really get in touch with their body and then find like energy uh, spaces within their body that are usually attached to some kind of emotion or vulnerability. So there's just simple steps to it. So I would really encourage people to check that out. Um, the practice is called focusing, or I think they sometimes call it biofeedback. And then I have to add this, Ryan, I know you'll appreciate it, but I'm really serious about this. I think uh, adopting a rescue dog is a really good thing for eights. <laughs> you know, th- just the being around vulnerable creatures has a way of really softening the eight and helping them get in touch with their uh, vulnerable side. <laughs> I was joking with Chris at the top of this episode that every time I ask him how he's doing, he usually opens with uh, telling me how Basil's doing. <laughs> and I just so love that. Oh, isn't that interesting? <laughs> that is interesting. Yeah. It's very telling, you know, like Basil really helps him get in touch with his own insides. Thank you so much to Felina for taking a minute to to share those thoughts with us. Seriously, so, so appreciate it. And uh, go check out her books, Mindful Silence and Pilgrimage of the Soul uh, by Felina Hewitt. All right, so here's a little bit more from Chris, our, our resident type eight, uh, and he's going to share a little bit more uh, for, for those of you in relationships with type eights. So in relationship with eights, you, you have to, to be aware that because they're a rejection type, they're, they're looking to be rejected. There's a kind of assumption that they'll be sold out or, or, or betrayed. And, and so what can sometimes come across as them rejecting you, like I've, I've, I've tried to say in a few different ways here, is a kind of testing. And so they need to know that there is going to be some stability and that there is going to be a, a commitment in, in light of even the, the, the worst of them coming forward or if they feel like occasionally there's too much of them that that they that they sort of bring into the relationships, I'd also say in relationship with eights, like it, you know, there there is a kind of hidden tenderness there, and uh, they really don't feel safe sort of sharing that with with many people. And so, if you ever experience it, like to to honor it, to to really receive it as as a cherished gift. In eights, you know, I I also think that it's helpful. If people give us permission to explore the the things that break our hearts, and and for a lot of eights that that's going to obviously and and, and first sort of come out as the things in the world that that we're trying to fix, trying to protect, trying to heal. Um, but man, when you start to to see the tears of the eight or the confessional tenderness of the eight, um, to to be able to work with that with 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 sensitivity is is a real skill and and it's a real invitation um, for deep connections because when an eight really connects with you there's a kind of loyalty there that that you will find remarkable i'll also say this with with eights that vengeance can can really lead to to resentments and grudges but man if if you've hurt an eight if you've let an eight down if you've failed an eight or betrayed an eight and you're just honest about it man eights are honestly it's 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 astounding one of the most forgiving of the types but until you own it, until you really ask for forgiveness or, or make the right kind of apology, they'll they'll hold things over your head, and uh, and so you'll see this. Like I, I think it surprises people about us that man, you could you could do the worst thing imaginable to us, but if we know you're sorry and we trust that you're sorry, hey, we're we're cool. It's the people that that never own the way that they've hurt us that that we're going to to keep at a distance and that that we're gonna going to continue to antagonize. And you'll see this too with eights. Um, when you talk about the, the the subtypes or the instinctual variants based on that self-preservation, sexual, and, and social sort of driver within each of the types, you know, I'm, I'm a social eight, right? I, I, I experience my, my life through belonging. I experience my life um, and I prioritize my life 
through power dynamics and, and, and being part of groups and, and, and hurting people, let's say. And, and what's sort of a bummer for me years and years ago is when I came across this, Claudio Naranjo had called that social eight solidarity. And, you know, for the first 20 years of my adult life, I was an international humanitarian. And, and I almost, when I started to come across this, I almost felt like, man, is, was there no way I, I could have otherwise done anything else? Was this predetermined? And, and I don't think these things are predetermined, but I do think um, when you can find an A who, who really sees their sense of self expressed through how they engage their social concerns, this is one of the easiest and most effective ways for them to also get in touch with that inner child. Um, this is one of the, the the easiest ways for them to get in touch with with what breaks their hearts. And and man, when you can see these eights sort of find that compassion outside themselves in relationship, really help push it back to them so that they can see it inside themselves as well. And, and this is um this is the hard work for all of us. Ah, that's so good. Thank you so much, Chris. Uh, and that's exactly what I was trying to point to uh, in the lyrics of this song. Uh, that that compassion, that vulnerability, the the inner child, the risk of being wounded, all of that is the opposite of weakness. It, it's it's absolute strength. And as I was writing, uh, or maybe I should say as I was wrestling the lyrics, uh, I hit a moment of really looking at my type 8 friends and realizing that each one of them are are making a huge imprint in their world. Uh, in their families, in their in their various fields of work, uh, many of them specifically through humanitarian work, uh, the common thread in all of my friends' lives is that they are making a huge impact on everything that they are a part of. And what a huge gift to contain so much strength. Uh, and when they channel it towards goodness, it's it's really incredible. Uh, so in the song, after the character consents to vulnerability, they open up their doors a bit. I realized that that was really only a part of the story because with the gift of, of tenderness and vulnerability, eights are just not going to sit on the sidelines. They are going to put everything they have into leading and protecting those in need. Uh, so thinking about my friends and the, and the hard work they've done inside themselves, um, I, I wrote these these final lyrics i'll shake the ground with all my might i will pull my whole heart up to the surface for the innocent for the vulnerable i'll show up on the front lines with a purpose and i'll give all i have i'll give my blood i'll give my sweat my ocean of tears will spill for what is broken i'm shattered porcelain glued back together again invincible like i've never been uh, and that word invincible is a word usually associated with the shadow side of the type eight, the unhealthier parts, uh, as they feel and act as though they are invincible. But I, I wanted to flip that notion on its ear a bit and, and say that at their best, in spite of being hurt or betrayed, when they pull their whole heart up to the surface, uh, they are a form of invincible. Uh, so that felt like the right language for the end of the song. Uh, and speaking of humanitarian work, uh, Chris actually served alongside Mother Teresa, who many folks have mistyped as a type two. Uh, so I asked Chris if he wouldn't mind sharing a bit about his time with Mother Teresa. Uh, so here's Chris. Yeah. So I, I do think that, you know, one of the most chronically misdiagnosed eights out there was Mother Teresa. And uh, I, I did a lot of work with her for the last three years of her life. I, I ended up sitting with her probably a dozen or 15 times every time. I, I was living in India back then. And every time I had friends who would come to visit me, we'd go up to Calcutta to, to volunteer with the missionaries of charity. And, and if she was in town and if she was well, um, she'd always make time to, to meet with us. And, and Mother was, was incredible. And, and yes, you see that tenderness and you see that compassion and you see that drive in her to, to heal the world. But I, I sometimes joke around that that mother was also a ball buster. It's get out of her way. And and there was an intensity and a toughness. And and, and I mean, honestly, this old nun was tough as nails. And so you, you also see this in mother who I, I, I'm convinced after spending all this time with her was a social ape. And, and, and the social eight is the counter type of all the eights. It's the eight that doesn't look eight-ish enough for the other two. It's the eight that actually does have a kind of softness about them. But what the softness is 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 actually sort of in in relationship to is the projecting outside of themselves uh, again what they don't want to don't want to face inside themselves. And, and I'm not saying that that was mother's experience, but man, you you saw this in her. You saw this this concern. And so for the 20 years, the 20 years that I was uh, 
involved in, in international humanitarian work. And, and this was working with little kids who had been conscripted to fight in civil wars and in places like Sierra Leone during the Blood Diamonds conflict. This was working with children who had been orphaned um, because of AIDS or born HIV positive. This was a lot of work in the anti-human trafficking arena and, and in places like Bolivia and, and Thailand and, and, and Nepal. For me, it was less about my heart being broken over over compassionate or the lack of compassion in, in scenarios of, of, of tremendous human pain. And it was really more about an issue of injustice. And, and you also see this, that this need to be against that AIDS have sometimes shows up in their need to be against injustice, unjustice, repression, suppression, the exploitation of, of, of vulnerabilities. And so we have great mentors. We have great teachers and, and luminaries like mother to look to. And if you're an eight and you could almost sort of adopt mother as as, as your patron saint, I, I do think looking and living into the to the gifts of her legacy and example can can bring out the best in us. What I think is is really interesting about eights is they have a an uncanny ability to allow for diversity of, of thought or political persuasion or religious tradition um, into their, 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 their group of friends. And I would say this if you're an A and, and you're sort of are living in your own echo chamber, that to get outside of that um, not only sort of helps bring what's in your blind spot forward, but it is one way of, of learning to be compassionate for, for the so-called other. And so I, I, I think I've, I've been really fortunate in my life to be surrounded by diverse conversation partners who, who help me see myself and, and how I relate to my positions, opinions, values differently. And this is, I think this is a great gift that eights can show the rest of us, that sort of living in dissonance is a kind of truthfulness. And, and maybe this speaks to that holy truth that sort of shows us the oneness of all that is in, in charity and in love, humility, and, and honesty. Ah, oh, Chris, thank you. Seriously, so, so much. Uh, your your insight, your wisdom on all of this stuff has been such a gift. And for this particular episode, as you talk about your type, it means a lot that you would uh, take the time to to be vulnerable in that way and open up to us. Uh, so let's go ahead and switch gears and talk about the fingerprints that are on uh, this song. And as a refresher, fingerprints are what I'm calling these little tiny recordings that I've asked my my nearest and dearest friends that happen to identify uh, as the type that I'm writing about. And so they send me these recordings of literally anything. It can res- represent them. It could be uh, just a sound that they like. Uh, so it could be anything. So these are the sounds that my, my dear eight friends uh, were kind enough to send my way. Okay, first up is Chris Hewerts. Uh, he sent actually three sounds that I was able to, to weave into this song. Um, so the first is, of course, his puppy, Basil. <laughs> I'm not sure why, but I think that kind of sounds like a cat. Uh, so he might want to go ahead and double check that Basil is, in fact, a puppy. Uh, and his next sound was used quite a bit in the uh, percussion, uh, in the big hits in the middle of the song. Uh, and it's the sound of Chris punching the ceiling of his car. Uh, he calls it rage punching. <laughs> and Chris's last sound is him rubbing a lucky penny onto his movie pass card. <laughs> So when MoviePass actually worked and you could see movies with it, um, Chris and I were, were very, very, very in love with uh, that service. And so, uh, <laughs> so that's Chris wishing that the service would return to its former glory. Okay, the next fingerprint sounds are from one of my absolute favorite people on the earth and, and closest friends, Roger Sandberg. Roger is the Vice President of Field Operations at Medical Teams International, uh, which provide life-saving medical care to refugees. And it's been so beautiful to see my friend uh, over the years actively making the world a better place uh, and to see an eight use their strength for for the good of all. Uh, So Roger sent me two sounds. Uh, First, he sent the perfect sound of glass breaking. And he sent me a note along with it that says, eights are often breaking things. As an immature eight, it is being a bowl in a china shop. And then he also sent the sound of a sewing machine. And along with it, he sent this note. 
I think a mature eight can look at things that need breaking, issues of injustice, and seek to break the injustices, then create or recreate a new system or structure. I think of our world as a tapestry, and I think eights are drawn to the tearing and fraying parts of the tapestry and want to be a part of the restitching. I love that so much. Thank you so much, Roger. Uh, you can hear the sound of glass breaking in a few moments in the song that have something to do with breaking. Uh, and you can also hear the sewing machine in a moment or two of the redemptive moments of the story. And what Roger doesn't know is that I also included a sound uh, in, in tribute to him, uh, and it is the sound of a sparrow. Uh, the next fingerprint sound is from my dear friend Anna Davidson, who uh, owns a restaurant in town that I absolutely love called Blackberry Market. Uh, if you haven't been there, be there. It's amazing. Um, but she sent me the uh, very appropriate sound of milk steaming. Uh, and you can hear that sound uh, a couple times in the song. Uh, anytime you hear the music crescendo, uh, that sound will lead into it. Uh, the next sound is actually from Anna's daughter, Emily. This is Emily Davidson uh, and her walking and owning the halls in her words, uh, sort of authority over the ground she walks on. Uh, and I split each of those steps up so that they land exactly where the drum hits are in the middle verse. Uh, and it was really interesting. The majority of my my type eight friends sent sounds that are, are sort of similar in that they have like a, a, a kind of hit quality. Uh, so I was able to take a bunch of these different sounds and place them under those drum hits in the middle verse. Um, so once I've shown you all the fingerprints, I'll actually show you how they sound all together in those uh, in those verses. Uh, the next fingerprint sound is from Daisy Klamala, who sent the sound of a coffee shop, which fits perfectly with uh, the steaming milk that we just heard. Uh, keeping things in the Klamala family, uh, the next sound is actually from Daisy's mom, Susan Klamala. Uh, she's the owner of the kitchen studio of Glen Ellen, uh, which is an incredible design studio for uh, for kitchens, bathrooms, and other uh, parts of the home. Uh, so she sent the awesome sound of walking in heels. Uh, which again were used in the in the hits of the middle verse. Uh, the next sound is from another best bud of mine. Uh, this is Jeremy Bloom, and he sent two sounds. One is the sound of his incredible uh, and very realistic dog barking sound. <laughs> <laughs> and Jeremy also sent the sound of him playing a middle C on his piano. And he sent along with it this note. I've always had a habit of playing fortissimo and have broken several keys on a few keyboards and even broke a string on an upright piano, including breaking a middle C. My piano teacher as a kid used to tell me that while she liked that I was playing with passion, that I didn't have to play so strongly or forcefully to be effective. I had to learn the beauty and value of dynamics. Also, as a challenger, I often find myself pushing against someone else's extremes. For example, if I feel someone is being too conservative in a conversation, I may debate them from a more liberal perspective just to challenge them. Make sure it's authentic and in essence pull them closer to middle C. I love that. Thank you so much, Jeremy. Uh, so I was able to sample that piano note uh, and made a little keyboard patch. So I played a few things throughout the song and I called it Jeremy Piano. The next sound is from my buddy, Scott Harrison, who is the founder and CEO of one of my favorite organizations in the world, Charity Water. Again, another amazing example of a type eight using their strength to quite literally make the world a, a better place. Scott sent the sound of um, him pedaling on his piano, which I used again under those hits in the verses. And a little bit of playing the piano too. Uh, the next sound is from my friend Suzanne McDonald, who sent the sound of her whistling. I love that sound. It commands a room. Okay, so the next sound is from my friend Jason Losey, who uh, insists that he is a type 8 in spite of what this recording says. I'm not an 8. <laughs> I love that. That's probably the most 8 sound of any of these sounds. Uh, the next sound is from my friend Michael Schneider, who, uh, who sent the sound of him coming home and uh, greeting his puppy. 
good girl. Hi, baby. Uh, this next sound is from a, a dear family friend of mine. Uh, I've known him since I was born, and uh, he's like a brother to me. This is Mark Holstein, and he sent the sound of his sweet kids laughing. <laughs> oh, I love that. Thank you so much, Mark. So the next sound is a pretty heavy one. It's from my friend Jeremy Courtney, who is the CEO and founder of Preemptive Love Coalition, which is uh, an incredible organization. If you're unfamiliar with it, please go check it out. Uh, they're doing some really bold and amazing things in this world. So when Jeremy sent me this sound, he actually sent along a note with it that I would love to read to you uh, before we actually listen to the sound. Attached is a clip that I happened to get on audio while in the early days of the fight against ISIS in Mosul. We were in a bombed-out church occupied by ISIS during their reign of terror after they'd driven the Christians out. They used the building as a training camp for their fighters, and when it was finally liberated and we entered, we found tunnels dug beneath the buildings connecting the town to the next town over, where they shuttled back and forth undetected from the airstrikes above. They had used their guns to shoot out all the crosses in Christian imagery, and they'd set up obstacle courses inside the sanctuary so they could stay fit without being outside and exposed to the airstrike. The audio opens with a few people in our group singing a solemn song of praise uh, at the bombed-out altar. There was no mass being held, and the scene was grim, but they couldn't help but worship. The clip ends two minutes later with airstrikes that sound like timpanies. It was surreal. This sounds like being an eight to me because there's something about my being an eight that has led us to these places and ultimately allowed us to help a lot of people in some of the most dangerous places on the planet along the way. I don't want to live in a place where people get bombed or shot or driven from their homes or kept at bay for who they are and how they pray and how they love. When I'm healthy and I'm at my best, my being an eight helps me press into pain and run through walls to bring about the more beautiful world our hearts know is possible. Jeremy, I can't thank you enough for, for sharing those thoughts with us, for sharing that recording with us, and uh, especially for the truly remarkable and important work that, that you and Preemptive Love Coalition are doing. So that's all the fingerprint sounds that are hidden throughout the song. Uh, thank you so much to each of those amazing eights uh, for letting me place these, these tiny sonic flags that represent them into the ground of the song. It, it means so much to me, uh, and I hope that this song honors each of them. Uh, so in addition to those fingerprint sounds, I actually put in a few uh, miscellaneous Easter eggs uh, just for fun. Uh, the first of which is, uh, so David Hodges and Chris Hewitts and I have a text thread. It's been going on for probably four years now, uh, full of all sorts of ridiculous things. And so I thought it would be fun to pay tribute to both of my, uh, my text thread eights uh, and, and convert a, a, a tiny clip of our text thread into Morse code. Uh, and that runs through a, a good chunk of the song, actually. Uh, it kind of supports the, the drone underneath the, the different layers. <laughs> and this one's totally ridiculous. Uh, as a small reference to the movie Spinal Tap, uh, whenever possible, as I was adjusting volumes and uh, different levels in Pro Tools, I would always uh, try to aim for setting everything to 11. <laughs> uh, and this next one is also super duper silly. Uh, in the lyrics, I wanted to reference Game of Thrones somehow, so I included the words, hold the door. Oh, and, and lastly, before I forget, I, I mentioned that um, many of the, the Type 8 friends sent fingerprint sounds of things that had like a hard hit, like a staccato hit. And these were used in the hits in the, in the middle verse. So I wanted to just show you kind of all together what those hits sound like. 
So this is the accumulation of heels and shoes hitting the floor, uh, pounding the the ceiling of a car uh, from Chris, the uh, the banging of the the pedals of a piano from Scott, the uh, the door opening and closing from Michael, and uh, a few other sounds as well as uh, I think I mentioned earlier, my wife's and my knuckles cracking. Oh, and glass breaking, and uh, the sound of uh, the the airstrike in in Jeremy's recording as well. So all of those sounds combined sound like this. And here it is in the context of the song. Break these bones till the better. I wanna break them right. Well, guys, uh, though there's a lot more to say about the Type 8 and uh, how this song came about, I, I will go ahead and leave things here. Uh, and now that you've heard a bit about how this song came together, uh, I would love to listen to it once more in its entirety. Uh, again, for anyone listening that identifies as a type 8, you are amazing. Uh, truly, I, I mean that. Uh, we need you. We need your strength. We need your vulnerability. Uh, and, and we need your invincibility, too. Uh, again, I so hope that you deem this song a worthy attempt at, at capturing at least a little bit of who you are uh, and uh, a worthy attempt at um, fitting the type 8 into a song. I remember the minute was like a switch was flipped was just a kid who grew up strong enough to pick this armor up and suddenly it fit. God, that was so long ago, long ago, long ago. I was little, I was weak and perfectly naive, and I grew up too quick. Now you. All that I have to lose And all I've lost in the fight to protect it I won't let you in I swear never again I can't afford, no, I refuse to be rejected I wanna break these bones till the better I wanna break them right and feel alive You were wrong, you were wrong, you were wrong My healing needed more than time When I see fragile things, helpless things, broken things I see the familiar I was little, I was weak, I was perfect too Now I'm a broken you but I can't let you see all that I have to lose All I've lost in the fight to protect it I can't let you in, I swore never again I can't afford to let myself be blindsided I'm sending God, I'm falling apart Just a kid who grew up scared enough to hold the door shut and buried my innocence. But here's a map, here's a shovel, here's my Achilles heel. I'm all in palms out, I'm at your mercy now, and I'm ready to begin. I am strong.
right. Thank you so much for listening, you guys. Uh, seriously, it means means so much that I get the opportunity to talk to you guys and uh, to share how these songs get built. Uh, and a huge thanks to Chris Hewerts and Felina Hewerts for their time and to all my friends and family that sent in their fingerprint sounds, uh, as well as the incredible musicians that were kind enough to be guests on this song. The song is available everywhere that music is. Uh, I'll have a link to that in the show notes along with everything else we've discussed. And uh, I'm already hard at work on the Type 9 song, which happens to be my type. So I'm very excited to learn more about uh, the Type 9 and myself. (laughs) And I can't wait to share everything that I'm learning and writing about with you real soon. All right, have a great rest of your day. Thank you so much again.